So I'm going to proceed here. Um, the first thing is just to, to point out we're often in the digital health uh, community uh, running around looking for evidence about uh, what digital interventions to be applying to our health programs. And it's uh, worth pointing to and saying that the World Health Organization did a very large systematic review uh, in 2017, 2018, uh, which led to their first set of recommended digital interventions that were published in 2019. This was uh, based on all of the available evidence uh, at the time about which digital health interventions actually have an impact on things like uh, quality of care, health uh, outcomes, or, or uh, on uh, data quality, data use, um, with I think very high levels of endorsement. So uh, Dr. Tedros here in the opening to this, uh, putting forward the WHO position that a lot of these interventions that are recommended, we, we should no longer be thinking of them just as a, a luxury, but they're rather a necessity in order for us to achieve the sustainable development goals, uh, in order for us to really bring uh, quality of care to uh, every, every woman, every child, every person. Um, so from the University of Oslo, we agree with the, this, this stance. We also have, have done a lot in the last few years looking at these recommendations to make sure that the functionality present in Tracker aligns with the, the kind of recommended interventions. Um, in that set of recommendations, there were 10 or 11 uh, different uh, interventions and Tracker is set up to cover seven of those at least. Um, depending on how Tracker is used and which functionality that you intend to use it for. Um, but just to say that this, these uh, set of interventions, again, it relies very much on what you choose to do with it and how you set up your tracker configuration. Um, but knowing that there's an evidence base behind some of these functionalities. So really it should be uh, something that you're considering with your own implementations if you're setting up a tracker program and are going to be able to have access to kind of individual longitudinal data, the kinds of uh, interventions that you can put in place. I also wanted to give just a quick state of tracker use. Um, Often those that are familiar with DHS2 don't know how far along Tracker has come adopted until they become involved in one of the projects. Uh, DHS2, of course, began as an aggregate kind of HMIS system for reporting, for, for analytics, uh, for capturing data from the district level and above. But it's been over 10 years now that we have had uh, the Tracker component in DHS2 collecting individual longitudinal data. The system itself has progressed quite a bit in that uh, amount of time. And at this point, at least as far as we've identified, we have at least 77 countries using Tracker um, at a large scale. Uh, most of those countries are using more than one Tracker program. They're covering a variety of health services using Tracker. Uh, again, we have kind of a minimum of 120,000 regular users, which in, in the world of, of DHS, DHS2 is, is quite a lot of users because we're, we're typically aiming then below the national level users. We're talking about the, the people at the labs, the people that are providing health services, the nurses, the midwives, the doctors uh, that are relying on Tracker day to day. Uh, so the, the extent with, with which Tracker is being used has uh, grown considerably. And we assume there's actually quite a bit more than this going on because of course we aren't uh, implementing these projects ourselves. There's many users that we never contact or that don't have uh, you know, a close connection to the University of Oslo, but they still are adapting and using Tracker for many different purposes. Despite that, uh, the fact that there's so many users of Tracker with so much functionality, the, it, it can be very overwhelming, uh, we realize, when it comes to adopting Tracker and starting out as a new Tracker user. Um, so I, I, in my mind, I liken it to this giant box of just mismatched Lego. You can do anything that you want, uh, but it often uh, seems a little overwhelming figuring out what all of the functionality is, how it best connects together, and what you can use Tracker for. So one of the initiatives that we've had ongoing actually for, for years now, uh, the University of Oslo is a collaborating center with the World Health Organization. 
And part of that partnership, we have been making pre-configured packages of DHIS2 that take into account the, the uh, global recommendations for given diseases or health areas, the indicators that are recommended, the, the kinds of uh, you know, decision-making that wants to be done. And we work closely with not only the World Health Organization, but some of their partners on creating these packages. So for example, we've worked very closely with Gavi, with UNICEF, with Global Fund, uh, with the, the HIV team at WHO, many different groups to create these different packages of DHIS2, which are pre-configured, are available to be added or adopted as your first package um, within DHIS2. The, again, we'll have a link here in the slides that will take you to the, the landing point on, on dhs2.org where you can get the documentation behind these packages. You can get the information about how to adapt them. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in the session, some of the, the key considerations of what it takes. I did just want to put a list here of the existing tracker um, pre-configured packages. Um, so again, all of these are packages which we have worked on with various global health partners um, and come up with uh, at least a standardized starting point for your tracker configuration in any of these various topics. Um, they're meant to help you to, again, take advantage of the functionality of a tracker. Uh, without needing to first become an expert. You can see from the, the package, the way that it's laid out, what components we are using, what data are being collected, what is the workflow and process, how do we do the sharing amongst users, the privacy settings, uh, pre-configured dashboards that provide the recommended analytics with the different visualization. So there, there's quite a lot available uh, to you if your country or your project is starting out in one of these uh, topics right now, uh, hoping to use Tracker or at least to see what Tracker could be used for. We also have demo sites set up for these packages, which again are in the link. Uh, so you can take a look before you ever need to install anything and see if it matches the requirements that you would have for your national system in any of these various topics. So in my mind, these uh, packages are a bit more like this set of Lego. So they already uh, tell you what you can be building. They come with instructions. They, they make it a little bit easier than that giant bucket of uh, Lego to have a vision about where you're going and know that you will end up with a certain uh, final state of the tracker configuration. So now I would switch over a little bit to talk about why. Um, you would use Tracker, um, and we'll start looking at kind of the, the prerequisites before you begin a Tracker implementation, or if you're trying to strengthen a, a Tracker implementation that is maybe giving you troubles. The, the first thing to point out is that Tracker does come with kind of benefits and challenges. Um, it's important to be prepared for what those challenges are and try to mitigate them. Um, I think that the, it's, it's not unique to Tracker, this idea that we in the public health space want to have better individual level data. Um, this has always been the, the hope um, and the kind of cornerstone of proper health decisions, health management decisions, clinical decisions, is to get the actual individual level data where it is generated. Um, whether that's coming from the, you know, a lab sample and the result of a test or whether it's the, the patient uh, providing information about their nutritional choices. This is the information that really allows us to, to dive much deeper into a given health topic and, and allows a Ministry of Health to make more informed decisions about, uh, about uh, the use of medications, about uh, the diagnosis processes, about the reach of a given disease. Um, so there's, there's much that can be said for capturing this individual level data. A lot of it can be structured to not only provide that data for decision making at the higher levels, but also provide some benefits to the people collecting the data. So if you are a healthcare worker, you're seeing a patient, you can enter their information directly into the system and it will generate the reports for you. So saving you a lot of the time that you would need in, in order to do your, your standardized reporting. But it can do more than that. It can provide you with decision support. It can produce a working list of those patients that need a follow-up. 
uh, you can standardize uh, some indicators that make sense for a single clinic's management of a given disease. So there's, there's a lot of uh, benefit to trying to set up your individual data system so that it isn't simply a reporting mechanism, but it actually can be used day-to-day -day operationally while also collecting the data that you want for reporting. This data that you're creating, because it is individual data, it's really useful long-term for conducting kind of ad hoc analysis, for diving in when there's a new health complication or a, a new medication is administered. You can go back to the individual level data and do new kinds of analytics that you hadn't planned for previously. You don't have the problem of trying to disaggregate something that was previously aggregated. The data are there for you to conduct kind of the research and, and policy decision analytics that you want to. Of course, all of this comes with increased complexity. So setting up the configuration of Tracker in the first place, uh, because you're thinking about clinical workflows or you're thinking about you know, structured data coming in from a, a level where they're not used to using digitization, um, Tracker itself, if you're, you're building out a national program, for example, supporting uh, antenatal care, that's going to mean that you have a large, much larger number of users than you previously ever had with your uh, health platform. Uh, they're collecting a lot of data. This brings performance considerations, hosting infrastructure considerations. And the data itself, by the very nature of it being individual data, is more sensitive. Um, it can be a part of a person's health record. The data, if you're registering people, it can be personally identifiable. And so it brings with it a lot of considerations about uh, privacy, about uh, the, the performance and how quickly and routine your system needs to be able to respond to the, the various uh, needs of the clinical worker. It's, it's much more catastrophic if your system goes out for a couple of days uh, than it would if it was just a reporting system. So these are significant challenges. They, they shouldn't be taken lightly. There should be a lot of planning that goes into ensuring that you have the resources and the team that you need um, and that you have the ability to support the number of users. So from our perspective, these are kind of the key considerations in these square blocks and the key prerequisites in the kind of long rectangular box at the bottom that would ensure that your tracker system actually does bring you the benefits that you see at the top. Um, so all of these components are critical. They require that your management team, your operational team, your supporting IT support structure, all of these different pieces are fit together well and that they are supported long term and that they can be kind of a sustainable uh, infrastructure supporting your tracker implementation. So these are the things that we'll now dive into with uh, a bit more detail. Again, we, we clearly won't be able to, to cover every aspect of these, but wanted to highlight some of the kind of most important information for any of the given areas to, to make sure that uh, people are going into the use of Tracker with their eyes fully open about the resources and the, the support that are going to be needed to ensure that it works well. So breaking these down um, into a couple of the different areas that we can have some, some quick points to mention. So the, the scale of a tracker implementation can be dramatically more than uh, what has been previously done in the, in the country or in the national health program. Um, it, it depends very much on how you utilize tracker and what you want to use it for. So it's very, possible, of course, to have a, a simple tracker program that you use with a small subset of users and that really all you're interested in is setting up maybe some sentinel sites for reporting. Um, and those that kind of scale is much more doable with kind of your existing team, your existing uh, IT support structure, the existing resources that you have. But what we've seen from most countries is that this is not what they want to do. Actually, what they, they want to do is to be able to push the use of Tracker down to the lowest level, uh, to the health sites, to the community health workers, and that this brings with it you know, a vast increase in the number of kind of IT support that you need with the, the performance requirements that there are for hosting an infrastructure um, for training, for example, which we have listed here. So we're, we're often asked kind of about the costs of Tracker. 
the cost uh, for configuring your tracker and setting it up and going through an approval process are very similar to what you would have done previously in a country that is using DHS2 for their HMIS, for example. But when it comes to training costs, this is where you see a, a vast increase in the amount of resources needed and the length of time needed. So if you're attempting to train 10,000 midwives, which is something that, for example, Bangladesh has done, uh, the training plan for that it has to uh, have a lot more uh, trainers, um, needs to have a lot more time, uh, cost a lot more money, and a lot of thought needs to go into things like the turnover rate. Um, if you're investing this much money in training uh, your entire cadre of, of midwives, how many of them will no longer even work there by the time the round of training is done? How many new people will have been hired that weren't a part of the training? So there's a lot to be considered there about, uh, you know, the, the reach and extent of uh, what you're trying to do with Tracker. Um, one key aspect of this is the IT support unit. Again, we've seen many countries that are well-functioning, already using DHS2 and other kind of software applications. They maybe have a core team of, you know, seven or eight people at the Ministry of Health or working, for example, with one of the HISP network organizations, and they are used to providing the routine uh, IT support to a cadre of maybe 100 users. Uh, when you jump from 100 users at you know, 20 sites to uh, 10,000 users at 3,000 sites, this is an exponential increase in the amount of kind of IT support calls that you will have. And so it'd be very important uh, important ahead of your rollout and ahead of the training plan to have structured uh, an IT support unit that can actually be responsive to their needs. Um, this very often uh, means that you create kind of a new level of IT support that is uh, based at the district or at the region. Um, you're maybe taking advantage of existing, uh, you know, data uh, staff that sit at the district level, and you're training them to handle kind of the, the first line of IT support. So when somebody forgets how to log into the system or they uh, don't understand why they're getting an error uh, when they haven't completed the form or something, that you have a large cadre of, of IT support staff which can at least answer those basic questions before re referring some of the more complicated things up to the higher levels. Um, that core IT unit sitting at the Ministry of Health should probably be expanded with some additional resources that are well suited to doing things like handling the hosting and uh, support infrastructure for a system that is much larger. Um, so, so again, just ensuring that in the program when there's planning about the resources and the ongoing resources, that a big part of that is making sure that you have an appropriate plan for the kinds of IT support requests that are going to come in from a, a vastly expanded user base. One of the other key considerations about what to do with Tracker is to think about the, the impact of doing real-time data entry versus secondary data entry. So if you want to take advantage of some of those key interventions that were recommended in the WHO guidance, uh, you, you want to be able to provide decision support, um, for example then the, you need to actually have a plan for something like real-time data entry, where the person that is doing the data entry is the person that also would need to receive the decision support, which comes based on the data they've entered, that a rule is triggered and it provides them with a recommendation. If you're not able to achieve uh, doing real-time data entry, then your program can probably be a little less complex. You're doing secondary data entry. You have a data clerk that's one step above the facilities that's taking all of the paper, individual data, and entering it into Tracker. This still is not the same as the aggregate data entry that they're used to. 
rather than getting a monthly report with their summed up numbers, they are now taking individual uh, records of some sort, whether it's the ART uh, treatment file or it's a lab result or whatever it is, and they're entering them in one at a time into uh, an interface that first required them to do a search, identify the person or the tracked entity that they're looking at and enter that data. So the process for entering individual data, of course, takes more time, uh, even if you're doing the secondary data entry, uh, because they're supposed to be assigning each of those data elements to something that's being tracked over time. Um, so again, it's a trade-off um, deciding whether you want to try to incorporate those benefits of real-time data entry uh, versus uh, pushing some of that uh, work onto a secondary data entry process. Um, and it's important to mention that you don't need to have a single approach for any given country or any given health program. So it would be very useful beginning your project to look at the, the reach of your network to see how comfortable your users are with adopting a real-time data entry system, uh, to look at where you have data clerks that you can take advantage of them doing secondary data entry, so it might be that in portions of your country, they are using Tracker as a real-time data entry system. In other parts of the country, they're doing secondary data entry. And still in other parts of the country, they're not even doing Tracker, they're doing aggregate reporting. Um, this, this is the most, I, I think, kind of responsible way to implement. So rather than making a single decision for the entire country that doesn't take into consideration their kind of current infrastructure or human resources, but you rather do a more in-depth look at who your targeted users are and what is likely to benefit them the most. And you can also then, of course, over time, bring some you know, additional sites into the real-time data entry versus secondary entry, or move some of the aggregate users finally over to doing an individual level kind of system. So there's, there's a lot to be considered there. This also has an impact on whether you're choosing to do your tracker system on Android or in the browser. Android is the solution that we have for offline data entry in tracker. Uh, if you're running the Android application, it's storing a local copy of the data, even when you're not connected to the server, and that data can be synced at a later time. Um, but of course, using Android then also brings a lot of complications. You would be most likely providing hardware to the users uh, rather than relying on them having their own. Um, the, the syncing process itself, you might need to have individual plans depending on the area and their network connectivity about how they sync and where they sync. So for example, you might want to train the users that at their site, they may not connect to the server, but when they go for a weekly meeting at the district, they need to bring the, the device and do a sync there, uh, for example. Um, so there's, there's some complications with adding in Android. There's additional cost associated with it. There's the uh, concept of needing to keep track of all of the hardware that has been put out there. Uh, for those that lose or break their device, how do they get a replacement? What is the supply chain for that? Are there existing you know, hardware resources that can be shipped to locations as they are needed to replace uh, their Android devices? And even the life cycle of the device itself. Are you planning for you know, the, the 10,000 devices that you put out into the field? Are they going to last one year, two years? Will you be able to replace those with another tranche? Is that built into the budgeting process? The, the web users, on the other hand, typically are those that are sitting at a site that has a strong uh, in, uh, network connectivity. Probably they already have at that site a, a computer, a desktop or a laptop computer, which they're using for other purposes. And so, uh, sorry, it looks like my screen has just decided to change what we were looking at. I'll try again. Um, so yes, the, the web is more appropriate for that type of user. The web has a constant connection to the server, or at least it only breaks connection very intermittently with, for small bursts. And so the system is essentially doing real-time data collection at that point, meaning that the data that are being entered would immediately be something that you could uh, analyze. Um, it's also available you know, from one room at the clinic to the other. 
they have just updated, you know, one part of the record as uh, the nurse has seen the patient, and then they are sent to another room for a lab, uh, and the data are available. On Android, unless both of the devices are connected, then you can't really expect that they're going to have the updated information in the next room over um, if you haven't been able to sync. So again, a lot to be considered there, trade-offs. Um, we see that uh, very often for these kind of large scale implementations, there's at least some portion of their user base that needs to be on Android in order for it to work well. But that will again carry additional considerations about IT support and who is uh, capable with the Android side and able to respond to those users as they have issues and, and many other considerations. So we, we are often asked about uh, how to plan for this then. We've, we've brought up a lot of different scenarios that have an impact on the amount of resources that you need and the, the length of time that it will take. Um, and so we have put together several budgeting tools. We have information that are in the DHS2 implementation guide, the tracker implementation guide, the Android implementation guide. We also have this spreadsheet that I've, I'm showing a screenshot of here, which was meant to give a sense of kind of the different levels of adoption around the packages. Uh, so the first yellow area showing you some of the costs for a basic kind of aggregate package, uh, maybe moving forward then to include more sophisticated packages like the electronic immunization registry, um, what those additional costs might be for things like field testing, et cetera. Um, it may be that the country wants to add some custom apps or build in some interoperability scenarios. Those have additional costs. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to give kind of a, a standard answer about what is the cost of implementing Tracker because it depends very much on what you want to do with it, how many users you're reaching, how, how long will the training go on for, how many trainers do you need, what is your hardware cost. From, from the software side, it's making sure that you have a team that is capable and can work with the tracker application, um, which is potentially uh, the same cadre of people that you have working on your aggregate system, but maybe not. Maybe you need additional people who have been trained with tracker. Maybe you need an external group that is providing support to the ministry. So it's, uh, again, we have some tools that you can use. A big part of what we will do in the level two academy is to have a planning spreadsheet that every user has and we fill out uh, regularly throughout the 10-day academy, adding in more information as you have it about what your implementation is uh, to again give you kind of a better estimate of the, the resources and the costing that are associated with adopting Tracker. So for those of you that, that either already have a Tracker system or are planning to introduce it, the, the Implementation Academy really is not focused on the software development. It's focused on the planning, on the management, on the day-to-day -day operations. And those are the kind of people that would benefit from attending. Uh, those that are responsible for making those decisions, for coordinating teams, for recommending timelines. So that's what would be focused in this, uh, the focus of this Level 2 Academy. Okay. I'm gonna stop my slides on, on this one. I'll, I'll turn it over to Marcus in just a moment. I know there have been questions that have been coming up in the, the community of practice. Uh, please do add your questions there. We have some people responding to those and we'll, we'll cover some of those questions and answers uh, after Marcus shares. Um, this topic of interoperability, again, it's, it's often a question that is raised about what DHS2 will interoperate with and what Tracker interoperates with. Um, this, uh, we have, of course, standardized approaches for integrating with other systems. DHS2 and DHS2 Tracker have always been open systems with a strong API for connecting to other systems. Uh, we have the full documentation behind that. There, you know, every, every system that I'm aware of is making use of some aspect of the API to extract data they want, to share it with other applications, to do outside analytics. So it's, it's a very well supported and well used aspect of DHS2 that you can use the API to extract the data that you want. On the aggregate side, the standard that we follow is the ADX standard. And again, any other system that is using the, the ADX standard, it should be fairly straightforward to do a connection with the, the DHS2 aggregate data. 
for Tracker, we have built a fire interoperability layer in the last couple of years. Uh, the fire layer is, it comes out of HL7. It's meant to provide the standard approach to dealing with the clinical level data. The, what I would say right now about the fire interoperability layer is that it requires knowledge of fire as a standard. Uh, you would want somebody who is really an expert in, in the fire approach and understanding how to map this interoperability layer onto the system you want to connect to and the tracker configuration that you have set up. So there's, it's, it's not a simple fix. It's something that requires uh, some expertise. <coughs> Excuse me. We are, uh, of course, ourselves always working on additional connections to uh, any uh, system that would provide kind of a large scale benefit to the user base. So those that are ongoing right now that we're working on, um, one of the, the WHO packages is for reporting adverse events following immunization. There's actually a webinar on that uh, that's starting uh, very soon today. Um, this is, of course, extremely important right now with the COVID vaccine, being able to capture if there are adverse events and, and monitor the situation. And there's a global repository <coughs> that WHO supports for all of these adverse events, which uses the E2B individual case safety reporting standard. And so we have mapped the, the package, the WHO adverse events package in Tracker to be able to submit the information to this global repository. There are some 40 plus uh, DHIS2 countries that already have a mandate to report to this uh, global repository called Vigibase. And so being able to ensure that they can do the reporting using the DHIS2 application was uh, really important. We've worked closely with the core team behind this global repository in Uppsala, Sweden, uh, to ensure that we can do this kind of uh, integration. Another one that we're working on right now is uh, called DIVOC. Uh, it's a vaccine certification uh, platform that uh, is from a non an NGO nonprofit organization out of India. They've been doing uh, vaccine certification and other certification for, for many years. And what they have created is uh, you know, an open platform for countries to use the vaccine certification uh, capabilities of DIVOC for the COVID use case. Um, they rely on the W3C verifiable credentials standard, which is uh, something that we've been working on to, to show countries how to take, for example, the, the COVID uh, vaccine registry package and be able to link that up to this uh, solution for producing a vaccine certificate based on this global recommendations. Um, this is something, again, it's in the works right now. In fact, we've been exchanging information about it today. Uh, but we already have, a, you know, a recommended kind of approach for this. Countries that want to adopt it soon, uh, we could work closely with them to make sure that the prototype comes out well and that it could support their use case. We also, again, are, are closely working with WHO. Um, they've recently published their first digital adaptation kit. These kits are, again, focused on individual level data and provide uh, kind of non and technology agnostic recommendations about the standards and approaches to use for collecting clinical data. They've recently published the antenatal care digital adaptation kit. Uh, so that's something that we're working with now, understanding what's in that kit, what the recommendations are and ensuring that Tracker can adhere to the recommendations coming out of WHO. We are also asked all the time about uh, some of the other kind of existing digital health solutions in our space, such as ODK, ComCare, OpenMRS. All of these solutions are software that already have been integrated with DHS2 in many countries. Um, usually this is the result of some specific need for integration. And so there's been some custom work involved with linking those solutions, but it has done many different times in many different ways and done successfully. Um, so we, we know that these can be connected. We know that there are uh, various approaches to doing so but uh, that this DHS2 tracker can be mapped up to any of the kind of existing solutions that your country is using to make sure that the data are exchanged, to ensure that the data coming out of those systems is also available for aggregation and for use within the, the DHS2 HMIS, for example. But my, my key takeaway for this point is just to say, there's no easy way to do this. None of this is just plug and play. 
Uh, if you have interoperability requirements for your tracker solution, uh, it's important to think those through early on in the process of, of adopting tracker plan to have a team that provides support for interoperability. There will be a process of mapping which data that you want to exchange with another system or receive from another system, making decisions about whether fire is the standard that will work, or if your other system doesn't use fire, is there another way that you're going to be exchanging data? Having somebody who can manage working with the DHS2 API. So again, it's, it's something that, you know, it's, it requires a dedicated stream of work. It requires people that know what they're doing. And this really, for, for the foreseeable future, this is how interoperability works. Um, it's the same for all other software applications. There's no such thing as kind of a free, easy way to interoperate systems. It always is going to require somebody making key decisions and somebody putting in the effort to ensure that those systems remain connected over time as you make changes to DHS2 or as the system you're exchanging data with changes. So with that, I think I will uh, pause my presenting and I'll turn it over to Marcus to carry us through some of the, the next topics. And uh, again, I'll be taking a look at the questions that have come into the COP. We have others answering them. Please uh, feel free to put your, your questions there. We'll come back to those uh, questions once Marcus is done with uh, the next round of slides. So Marcus, over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks Mike. Yeah, so um, uh, the next topic that we're gonna cover is, um, is some key considerations for design and configuration. And um, in many ways going from, from aggregate to, to tracker is like, it's more like going from zero to one than from going to one to two. And um, for the design and configuration process you have to go through, it's, uh, this is also true. Um, the options for building and modeling, especially a tracker pro program is, is vast. Uh, there is a lot of different ways to solve a problem. Um, everything you do is directly affecting a lot of users, uh, a lot of pro users that is probably gonna use your, your program um, for um, much of the day. Um, and making a design for a tracker package or for a tracker instance is, is um, is a very critical process that will require um, uh, design skills and it will require um, interaction with the users. It will require knowledge about the options that is available to the, um, uh, to, to the team uh, configuring and setting up Tracker. Um, so what we have been seeing over the years is that uh, when everyone starts uh, from scratch, um, then uh, there's a lot of things that can be done very differently and a lot of goals that can be met in very different ways and that makes it hard for us as product managers to to um, make sure we build the best software for you uh, because every time uh, we make an assumption we are essentially wrong or some someone has um, done something creative that we didn't know about so it's very valuable to try to um, point everyone more or less in the same direction when they're going to build um, a tracker implementation. And one of the tools we are using to achieve this goal is the tracker packages. So Mike, uh, compare the tracker packages to a, a box of Lego um, or the, to an instruction manual for Lego. Uh, so if DHS2 is, um, is, a, is a box of, of, um, of plain Legos, then um, these tracker packages are kind of pre-built sets that will help you uh, this help describe how uh, a, a Lego house like this might look. Um, and uh, the tracker packages are useful in many ways um, to uh, as a starting point, as a learning tool, as inspiration. Um, and when you are starting a tracker project, one of the first things you have to look at is uh, is your existing ecosystem. Uh, do you have DHS already? Um, or do you have a system already? Um, do, you have, um, do you have something that you need to integrate with? In many countries, you have, uh, you have an, an existing DHS instance. Um, you, you would probably have an existing instance with um, uh, your HMIS, potentially. Or you might have existing tracker programs. 
Um, and looking at uh, the existing uh, um, ecosystem is very important when deciding how to proceed um, with your tracker pro um, pro uh, project. Um, and it's important to think about when you're when you're uh, considering starting with one of these packages that has been built. Um, picking up a package, uh, you essentially have two ways uh, you can directly use it. And, and um, if you're starting from a blank slate, if you don't have an existing ecosystem, installing a package is very, very easy. Um, it's uh, it's uh, just a few clicks and the package starting point would already be running. Um, if you have an existing ecosystem, then you will either have to look at integrating the package with your existing data, uh, with your existing uh, setup. Um, and this can be a pretty involved process, um, linking your existing uh, attributes and existing data and definitions uh, to this package um, is, uh, is not something to uh, underestimate. Um, so what some instances end up using and doing and what we think is useful is that instead of taking the package entirely and importing it as it is, um, you might kind of pick up the manual for the package, the design reference, and you might even build the program from scratch, matching your metadata and your, uh, your situation, looking at the uh, book that followed your Lego set instead of installing the entire Lego set. Um, there is, however, always an adaption process, it seems. And um, when, when, when starting a new program or, or um, a new instance of, of Tracker, um, there, is, um, uh, th there is always, there should be a review with the stakeholders for this, um, uh, for this, uh, this uh, product that your, uh, your end goal is. Um, and they would have to review the, the configuration and, uh, and your goals for the, um, for the setup. Um, in, in most cases, there would also be national guidelines that would um, maybe not adhere exactly to the, the guidelines that was used for building the package. There is, there is some types of packages that is more um, uh, where the WHO uh, recommended guidelines are uh, more, um, more universal. And there's other programs where these are not so universal, where, they're national, um, where the national guidelines differ more. Um, for example, for modern child health, um, there, there seems to be quite big differences um, between national guidelines and WHO recommended guidelines. And, and therefore, um, any package, even if you uh, start from fresh, um, you would have to review the underlying guidelines and, and uh, potentially change to match your country, um, country guidelines. The, the last point there on the adaption process is that uh, you uh, it it comes a little bit back to the um, to the users as well. Um, it is usually a good idea to start small and then scale up. Um, and um, one of the advantages of this is that you will you will most likely not hit one hundred percent the first time and your actual users and actual use cases will, um, will um, uncover problems uh, that you need to fix. And, uh, and um, fixing these problems uh, with a smaller, um, smaller group is uh, usually a good idea. Um, so that uh, your big country training and training trainer of trainers um, doesn't have to be done again if you have uh, changes, um, significant changes to the, to the setup and design. Uh, okay. And then the last part that must not be forgotten is the, uh, the HMIS. If, the, if there is an HMIS, um, and this is, comes a little bit back to the first point of the existing ecosystem, if there is an HMIS um, and um, you are introducing a tracker, it might very well be that um, the indicators of the HMIS should also be reviewed. Uh, most of the packages for Tracker are coming with a with a sister package for uh, for aggregate uh, HMS, and and these um, are also undergoing reviews from time to time. 
and we have seen that in many use cases um, it is useful and you should go back and review your HMS. Um, if that, that is not an option, uh, then at least make sure that the tracker uh, is collecting the, the data needed for your indicators. Um, if you have an existing HMS or reporting needs, that's going to be served by this, um, by this tracker package. All right, and this is uh, oops. Uh, this is also the next topic uh, I want to cover, and this is another room of the house that uh, Mike showed us earlier. Um, because uh, in in many use cases, the the tracker will serve different purposes, and one of the purposes um, is uh, very often reporting an HMS. Um, and um, uh, the existing data in your HMS is quite different than the tracker data that you're collecting. Uh, and uh, just highlighting some of these differences, the HMS would normally be time-boxed reporting and, and um, your users would spend, um, uh, spend some days uh, entering the data and, and um, uh, using the system. And, and um, maybe much of the month is, uh, is uh, the, the users wouldn't enter data at all. Um, the, uh, the reporting happens in, in batches. Um, then the data use is more of something that's ongoing, um, but reporting happens in batches. Um, uh, and that's uh, in most cases where the vast number of users actually log into your system and interact with um, this, um, this uh, instance. Um, in HMIS or aggregate, the, any errors you might go and fix at the central level. And, um, the uh, the central level might be the the district, or it might be higher up. But you might fix um, fix anything uh, that is wrong with your data, add a note to why you did it, and and pass on the report. Um, usually, data is less sensitive. This is uh, always uh, well. We think that this is. Um, at least compared to tracker data, the, the aggregate data is less sensitive. It's not personally, personally identifiable, um, which, um, which makes uh, a data leak less significant, for example. Um, if we compare this to individual record, records or tracker, um, there, there's one point I want to bring up that, um, that uh, might always be so well known. All, all tracker data can can be aggregated in your DHIS instance directly. Um, there is tools for aggregating the data. There is tools for making advanced calculations. There is tools for um, uh, you can make indicators that um, directly count how many um, HIV patients you have on treatment, for example. Um, and you can make dashboards from your tracker data. Um, the uh, reporting, however, is not um, is not time boxed in the same way. Reporting happens more um, in in um, an organic way when uh, when real world events happen. They they would get entered into the system, and it would not be, be uh, based on uh, routines necessarily. Maybe there is a end of day routine to enter the today's patients, um, but. Um, uh, the, the reporting is more directly uh, related on real world events. And if, uh, if there is an error, you would actually have to go and, and fix that in the individual uh, record. If your dashboard that aggregates all your data says that you have uh, 100,000 on treatment and you know that the, the number should be 100,001, then there is an individual error in your data and you have to go and find that single patient missing and add the missing event to his profile to fix that. Uh, fix that aggregation and fix that data. Um, it's not just a matter of updating a report. Your aggregate would uh, would uh, would not change um, be changeable unless you actually fix the underlying data at the lowest lowest level. Um, also, if if an event comes in late, if you find a piece of paper that should have been entered a long time ago, then your best course of action might be to enter that into the system, even though it's old, even though it should be entered um, uh, one month ago. It's better to enter it because it might be part of, um, it might have significance uh, in the clinical sense. Um, it's, it might be an important part of the history of the patient. 
um, and it might also in the uh, it might also affect indicators um, that will be calculated later. So usually fixing the data uh, by updating the record is always the best course of action. Um, and this is a bit breaking with the um, HMIS, um, HMIS world where you would, uh, you would uh, not go back and change an old and already submitted report in the same way. Um, Another big difference between the tracker and aggregate, and we get to this a little bit later, it, is that the data is very sensitive often, and it might be um, it might be a personal disaster at least, um, and it should be a national disaster if your HIV um, HIV um, data gets leaked into the wrong hands, for example, uh, exposing the names of of um, or infected uh, persons. Um, and um, the amount of people that should have access uh, is um, is different. The the actual access they should have to the data is might be very different. Um, and uh, the number of people that can see data from multiple clinic clinics is is um, is very low. Um, so uh, there's other considerations when securing the both the server and setting up the configuration for the aggregate part of your um, of your tracker. Yeah, sorry for your track uh, individual record uh, records based uh, compared to your aggregates. Um, another point to bring up as a difference is that HMIS aggregate reporting is uh, is based on on reporting guidelines, and there is uh, there is um, uh, a certain established way of using this data. Um, but when you set up a tracker, there might be other useful indicators that is operationally useful, um, which um, can be very clinically relevant, can be um, even spawning whole new ways of using your data that is not using the HMIS aggregate. It's not going into the re your uh, monthly report necessarily, but it might be data that is, that is very useful in monitoring and, um, and evaluation, and it might be useful clinically, and um, it might even be a tool for, for clinicians um, in other work tasks or planning. So this is something not to forget uh, when we talk about um, the, the tracker data as opposed to the, the aggregate um, and feeding into the aggregate. There might be aggregations you want to do that does not feed into the aggregates. Um, yeah, the last point there uh, is just that the, the, um, your system might be um, critical um, and, um, and um, access to the data might, uh, might be um, at the diff uh, well, the criticality of having your server up at all times might be different in your tracker and aggregate uh, instance. So um, pulling these two together, combining tracker and aggregate, what we often see is that uh, one challenge is that we, if you have an HMS and your tracker data is going to feed into your HMS, um, there will be a period of time where some parts of the country would would not yet have the tracker, and you would need uh, you would need uh, individual data from from um, uh, you, you would need to have uh, still aggregate reports for that, those parts of the country that does not have the tracker. Uh, you would still get the paper and and enter the, the aggregate number somewhere, and in some parts of the country this might be supported by a tracker, and the data might even um, even be fed in directly um, from the tracker uh, from the tracker system. Um, when um, uh, it, it, it is possible to create a report based on tracker data um, directly, uh, but it might be sometimes a good idea to to um, combine the data from the tracker and from non-tracker sites into an aggregate form um, and uh, and submit them together um, instead of um, instead of only relying on tracker. Um, this uh, this would in many cases mean that you need to have some sort of uh, mechanism to move data from your tracker to the aggregate. And we have a lot of scripts and we have support for this in, um, in, in the APIs. 
uh, we have knowledge about this in our community and moving tracker data into aggregate is uh, is uh, definitely possible um, we are also working on the roadmap on a feature for making this uh, easier and, uh, and making this part of the user interface in DHIS so that you wouldn't have to have any script skills or, or, um, or uh, set up uh, server jobs to move this data uh, over. Uh, so that is upcoming. We, we haven't pinned that one to a release yet, but it's uh, one, of the, um, one of the first releases uh, we, are, we are seeing that this should be planned into. Um, another impact or uh, thing to think about is the difference between how the data is entered. The, the HMS um, uh, reporting uh, might not play so well with, uh, with uh, the uh, tracker indicators or the, track, the indicators based on individual records. Um, just for the fact that um, uh, the individual records would, would uh, potentially be entered outside uh, the time box reporting that uh, most HMIS has. Um, so you can very well add a new track into the instance or add a new individual record after the report has been submitted. And then um, if, uh, if you do your calculation again on your da tracker data, you would see that the number has changed. Um, and then your report is already submitted, but the, the number is now not the same on the tracker instance as on the um, aggregate number. Um, the last consideration is the access and security. And, and we see that in many cases, tracker and aggregate has different, um, different um, requirements here. And we'll get a little bit into that later. Um, but uh, all this adds up to uh, that usually you would have a tracker instance and an aggregate instance uh, running side by side. And, and um, data would be moved from the tracker to the aggregate uh, with a script or by manual means. Um, and, um, and the tracker data would, um, would have a more fluent life, uh, also be secured much, uh, much tighter and might have different uh, routines for, um, for updating, for example. Um, the hosting and security is the last point uh, topic I will uh, touch on with you before we go into questions. And um, we touched a little bit on it that the tracker uh, instance might uh, be set up on an instance for the sole res uh, on a different uh, server for the sole instance that the security considerations is um, is much stricter for a tracker uh, usually than it is for an aggregate. You would be very much more careful with your user accesses. You would be um, uh, the disaster would be much bigger if you would lose this database or um, give too much access to someone uh, that will um, uh, steal and sell the data or or leak it. Um, so um, this is also an area where uh, where where you it's more like going from zero to one than from one to two. Um, we, uh, on the hosting side, and uh, the, the other part of this uh, that I'm going to be touching mostly on now is the um, is the uh, the hosting and the performance and what you can expect uh, because this is also um, this is always a very uh, central question uh, for for you who are thinking about starting or are setting up a tracker instance. Um, you might be wondering what can this tracker instance actually do, and we have some numbers from the field. Uh, to help this decision a little bit. Uh, we have the Sri Lanka COVID system where they have 16 million TEIs, which TEIs mean, means persons for those who don't know that, um, which uh, is tracking 16 million individual individuals um, and uh, with COVID surveillance. Um, uh, the version is mentioned under there for a reason soon apparent. They are running 234.4. Bangladesh is running an older 233 and they have a very big instance of 38 million TEI um, and around 200 million events. Uh, that's a modern child health uh, tracker. And then I put Ghana here. Um, I could also have put the um, Burkina Faso, Tog Togo, um, um, his West Central Africa HIV's uh, server, which is uh, around the same size. Uh, Ghana is 2,500 users and 225,000 tracked uh, tracked people um, they're running 234.2 and 
why, why did I put this up between the, between the others? Um, yeah, the, these are all servers that's pushing the, the boundaries of DHS. Um, the Ghana is no exception. They are also pushing the boundaries and I'll get a little bit back to that uh, later. Um, we um, are doing uh, an initiative that is um, uh, that is uh, also pushing the boundaries for tr uh, for tracker and DHS uh, these days, and that's the COVID vaccine uh, performance test initiative. Um, as the COVID vaccine is getting rolled out in the world, one of the questions that everyone needs answered is: Can we actually su uh, support this with tracker? Uh, can the tracker support the volumes I need? So we have done, um, we have started an initiative um, and um, uh, run some, some tests, have some numbers that I will uh, bring to you here. Um, and you can see the server specs, it's run on a quite big server. Um, it's a um, uh, database, we, which would be the existing data in our test database is um, uh, 3 million people. Um, 21,000 users. Um, we also did this with a much higher number of uh, users and org units. We started with 400,000 org units um, and, uh, and uh, 21,000 users across these um, uh, org units. And we found some bottlenecks that was unintended. Uh, so in our uh, official tests and numbers, we uh, had to reduce it to 20,000 org units. But at the same time, we worked on the bottleneck and, and um, it should now be fixed. So when we do a second round of testing, hopefully the, uh, the number can be 400,000 org units and 400,000 users on our next, um, next uh, iteration. Um, it's worth mentioning for those um, uh, in the room that in this case, the database and application was running on the same server. And in a tracker setup, it's much more common to have a database server and an application server separate. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, this is something to mention. Um, in this setup, um, we were running a sustained load of uh, between 500 and 10,000 users, um, delaying 30 to 50 seconds on the calls, um, which, um, which means that it was running 40 uh, requests per second for six hours. Uh, well, how much is 40 requests per second for six hours? Well, um, the, the number we can put beside this to illustrate it is that uh, it was 520,000 tracked entity instances that was imported um, with uh, 1.2 million events over six hours. So um, uh, this, this is um, like entering 500,000 new uh, persons into the COVID vaccine uh, program. Um, over the course of a new working day. Um, we were able to run it a little bit faster, but then it had some deterioration when, when um, uh, requests clumped together. So running 60, uh, 60 requests per second would mean uh, around 750,000 new tracked entity instances over six hours. But um, there, there, there was some, uh, we were starting to see some problems then, um, or starting to see the limits of the server. Um, we can also mention that we ran a smaller server uh, with only eight CPUs, uh, significantly smaller than the first one there. And it wasn't that much slower. Uh, it was uh, around 30% uh, 30 slower. Um, so this is, of course, one program that, uh, the, and, and the numbers we, we found from the COVID vaccine performance test. And, and, um, and um, this is um, one way of, of looking at the, um, the performance uh, and the capabilities. Um, one of the main things we got out of this uh, was that we will be actually were able to remove a lot of bottlenecks. I mentioned one bottleneck already. Uh, that we found when we used 400,000 org units, um, and that one was uh, was removed. Um, we have found other bottlenecks and and fixed a lot of bottlenecks uh, in later versions of uh, DHS2. And the main takeaway for us and the, and the team has been that we have been able to uh, really improve the, um, the the bottlenecks that we have found. Um, 
there is a but, however, and there is a uh, th there is a big but, uh, um, and um, we uh, we cannot uh, uh, deny the fact that the servers are very different and the use cases are very different, and this is what we see um, when comparing the um, the uh, the numbers from different countries. Um, also, when we set up the COVID vaccine um, uh, initiative in the last point, we see that these servers are extremely, extremely different. Um, and uh, the unknown bottlenecks uh, might be coming from program design, for example. And um, uh, just based on how your program is set up, you might uncover a new bottleneck. Uh, looking at the numbers from the previous slide, you might say, OK, fine, it seems like we can definitely run our pro program we will have less than 750,000 new persons into the system every day. Um, but um, these uh, measurements that we have presented here is, is, um, is just one finding that we have made. Um, when you install or set up or make a different setup, if you, if you take the COVID package and change it, you might introduce a bottleneck that we did, didn't find in our testing. Um, because with these packages, you can do whatever you want. So it's important to take these numbers for what they are. Um, uh, they are one observation. And if you change something, the observation might be different. Uh, we are, of course, working with these bottlenecks as we find them. But you might be the one finding them if you scale up. Um, and, and, um, and, and something is different in your settings. Um, we also know some designs that are heavy, that should be avoided uh, at all costs. Uh, right now, the biggest one to mention right here is the, um, when you make these operational dashboards, um, then you might get very nice numbers for your clinic. And you might calculate your, uh, uh, your 100 um, or uh, 300 persons on, on um, on treatment, uh, HIV might be easy to calculate on the, um, on the clinic level. So it's very useful to see for your clinicians that uh, we have 300 people on, on treatment now. Um, but this same calculation might be impossible to do on the national level because the amount of data is too high. So there might be a difference in what dashboards you can provide to the clinic versus what you can provide on a national level. And this should be going into your design. It should be going into your planning. And uh, we, you shouldn't sell um, sell very complex dashboards uh, on on national level to your uh, to your managers or your stakeholders. Um, on, another thing we regularly see is that custom codes and apps is an especially um, especially um, um, th there's an especially high risk when, when you have custom scripts, apps, and middleware running um, against the same backend, uh, the same DHS backend. And th the reason is that these uh, might be doing calls a little bit differently. They might be, uh, sometimes they are um, uh, not so fine tuned as the, the apps that um, the, uh, is delivered with, uh, with the DHS backend. Um, so that's uh, they might be doing calls that is heavy, or that at least introduces unknown bottlenecks that we have to fix in, in the backend code. Um, so this is one area of caution. And we have seen in some instances in some countries that, um, that uh, uh, some uh, unintentional calls are very heavy. The DHS backend is very open. You can do almost what you want. And you can do very heavy operations. Um, and it might not even be intended. So, um, so uh, this custom uh, custom scripts and apps is uh, something to pay extra attention to um, in your in your uh, in your setup. Another thing that is very important, and this might be the most important uh, point on the slide right now, uh, we have spent two thirty six development time on um, on fixing bottlenecks. And uh, in some instances, um, uh, calls are orders of magnitude faster than before in the latest versions of 234, 235, and 236. So um, when planning a project now, um, if you are not already on, uh, on uh, one of these main versions um, and you're introducing a big tracker, 
we would encourage you to look at the plan and see if there is room for upgrading to 234, 235 or 236, the latest patch version. Um, so uh, th these are the fastest at the moment um, by a long uh, shot. Uh, some last uh, considerations here is the um, the team. If you're doing a, an infrastructure and running a server um, for uh, a tracker, um, you should uh, not be training your team on doing this while, uh, and also expecting to succeed the first time. The, um, running a mission critical uh, and heavy loaded server like a tracker server usually is, is uh, something that uh, you should make sure you have at least one person in your team that has done before at large scale, maybe with different software, but uh, that has run such a big instance before. Um, the, the requirements for, for, uh, for uh, your infrastructure is so much higher uh, and, uh, and you shouldn't train your team and set up a tracker uh, at the same time. Um, that uh, red guy there should be working for you. He should not. Uh, you, you should not only start this if if all of the your team is the blue uh, blue persons uh, learning there. Um, you have to set up monitoring and make sure to follow the server health. Um, you you should have mechanisms that warns you if there is uh, trouble on the way, and um, and. Um, these will uh, help us if you run into one of the unknown bottlenecks. Um, we have a team that is um, that is um, often responding to uh, to servers that runs into these bottlenecks, um, known or unknown bottlenecks in the field. Um, and if we're going to help, what we need is server monitoring. And uh, and if you're going to find the problem before they ex uh, they uh, uh, they uh, affect your users and before they cause downtime and, and um, a part of uh, your country is not able to do their job, um, you also need the monitoring. Another thing so that's easy to forget until, uh, until you needed it yesterday is the disaster recovery plan. Um, do you have a plan for what happens uh, if the server goes down? Do you have a plan for what happens um, if you need to go back and and, um, and load an old database. Uh, did you test that the restore actually works? When doing a tracker system, um, then uh, there is um, suddenly a need for a disaster recovery plan, which is a well-known term. And this, is, this should be well-known to anyone who, uh, if you have that red guy on your team, the teacher, um, he should be telling you this. Um, Another thing that uh, the red guy there should tell you is that you need to do a risk assessment uh, for your for your server and for your uh, for your application, and and um, a, a risk assessment um, matrix might look like this, um, where you would um, you would go through every risk you can think of, uh, you would uh, scale them on this uh, sort of um, on this sort of a chart. Um, and you would uh, work on the um, high risk, high impact uh, points first. You would try to manage them. Then you would start uh, working on the um, the ones that is uh, either medium um, uh, in the yellow zone there, and then you would work on the green zone to where you have a low uh, low impact or low risk, and you would try to manage your risks. Um, and try to make sure that you, you, you have managed them and thought about what to do. Um, and when the disaster strikes, this, um, this, um, this chart is uh, what shows the world that you did your job. Um, yeah, and these are all topics that uh, we'll get, uh, get more into on the um, Level 2 Academy that's coming up. All right. Um, that's everything I was going to go through. We um, have some um, we have some uh, resources at the end here. Um, I guess the slides will be shared with with you all, and um, and you would be um, able to to click the links. Uh, uh, and this is um, some of the resources we mentioned. Um, and, uh, and, 
there's also a registration for the academy that's uh, coming up. I don't know if it's any spots uh, left there, uh, but uh, Mike and uh, Martin can probably uh, tell us. Um, I guess um, we're uh, with that. We're gonna go into the the last part of the session, which is the a little bit of questions and answers. Um, yeah. Oh. And maybe, yeah, maybe to jump in then. So we, with with such a large group, of course, it's it's a little difficult to do an, an active question answers. There has been a lot going on in the community of practice. So please take a look at the link that Alice has shared in the chat um, to see some of those. Um, we're still actively answering some of the more technical questions. There, there are people on our side. This link will live on past the, the webinar. So of course you can go back, we'll continue to be answering. I thought uh, maybe I would go through a couple of the responses uh, that are there in the community of practice, but also if you uh, raise your, your hand here or uh, try to speak up, we may be able to field a couple of live questions. We have maybe 10 minutes or so to, to try to address some of these. Um, but I'll start by, by maybe going back to some of the more general questions that are in the community of practice. So one of them uh, was about kind of the, the structure of configuring your program. So it was recognizing that Tracker is well suited for, for clinical services that have a schedule. Uh, such as uh, immunization or antenatal care, where you, you know kind of the purpose of each visit ahead of time, you have a bit of a checklist for the clinical person to walk through. Um, but the question was, is, it, is Tracker also well suited for, for health services where it is less of a checklist, less of a schedule? Um, so I, I wanted to, to take the chance maybe to talk a little bit about how we see Tracker fitting into kind of the concept of an EMR and how uh, you, would, you would handle some of these more kind of ad hoc services or unknown services. So uh, Tracker is, you can start with a very simple or lightweight program for Tracker. Um, you could be dedicated to a, a single service being provided at a health facility. Uh, you could set up, for example, uh, simply an ART register. Um, but that uh, same clinic is probably offering many other health services. Uh, maybe they are also seeing TB patients. Maybe they are also diagnosing malaria. And so one of the things that makes Tracker really suitable for, for this level of clinic uh, is that you can add programs over time. Um, and the programs themselves are linked because they share kind of the pool of clients or patients uh, where if you, you know, you have in your catchment area uh, people that have come in for services, when they come in for a new service, you can identify that individual, you can enroll them into a new program. Um, and that this we've seen for many countries, this matches kind of their, their, the funding project cycle where, you know, perhaps this year there's emphasis on building out the HIV program and perhaps next year there's funding for TB. And you could simply add the TV program when you're ready. Your users are already familiar with, with uh, the program because they've been using it for HIV. The interface is the same, but now they also have a TV program. So in, in this way, many countries have kind of built out within Tracker uh, a complete or comprehensive overview of all of the services that are being offered at at least one level of clinics. Um, so they would think of it as kind of their entire primary health strategy. Um, this usually, once you get to that point, you probably are adding in a non-disease specific program. So perhaps you have a lab program where all of the possible lab services are registered in that program. The, the tract entity can be, the person can be coming from HIV or they can be coming from malaria, but you register the need for the lab services in this additional program and the information is relayed back. Or you might have a generic kind of program for receiving clients or receiving patients where you don't know why they've come yet, you don't know what service you're going to provide, but you register them as an entity. They now are kind of in the tracker system. And once you identify a diagnosis or you want to provide services, you can enroll them from there into a more dedicated program. So it's, it's a very flexible kind of uh, data model. Um, we haven't designed Tracker to try to be a full scale EMR for something like a hospital to use. 
Uh, it gets a lot more complex in terms of trying to link all of these different services together. Um, but we also think that for many of the, the kind of levels of the country that we're trying to reach, the EMR is probably not appropriate for the, the level that you're capturing some of the primary services data or some of these kind of key health program data. Um, so again, there, there are many, I think, flexible ways of trying to configure Tracker to allow you to cover a whole range of services. The, the person registered in Tracker can be shared across programs, and we're working on extending our analytics model to allow for more sophisticated analysis across these programs so that you can start to have better insights into, you know, TB patients that are also uh, pregnant and then are diagnosed with malaria. I mean, you can, you can start to think of many different ways of approaching different subgroups and populations based on how they uh, are uh, enrolled across programs in your tracker system. So that was one that I wanted to share. Um, there, there are a couple of more, I think, technical kind of questions specific to how to set up your system if you want a certain type of analytics, whether it's line listing or carrying a patient over from one program to the next. Um, again, we're, we're answering those more technical questions in the community, so please take a look. I guess my, my additional thing that I would say is that these are exactly the kinds of considerations that you want when designing your program. So it's, it's very important to take uh, a, a deep dive into what are your analytic outputs? What do you need to be able to show in your outcomes? And then design the program that is related to that, that allows you to do the kinds of analytics that you want. So if you're, if you're new to trying to think through what tracker configuration you would use, I think it'd be really valuable to take a look at some of the questions that are coming up here in the community of practice so that you can see kind of what it means to decide whether something is an attribute versus a data element or what it means for analytics if you do repeatable stages versus a single stage. So these are these all have an impact on the types of analytics that you can do. Um, and it's important to know ahead of time that you'll be able to get the data that you want based on the way that you've set up your program. Um, another question that was in here somewhat uh, generally was about uh, uh, MDM, uh, mobile device management, if you're using DHS2 Android. Um, DHS2, we don't have our own mobile device management solution. This is software that allows you to kind of have a comprehensive look and control over all of your Android devices. There are many existing MDM solutions that are out there. Some are paid, some are free. We've written up guidance uh, as far as we uh, can recommend in the DHIS2 Android implementation guide. Um, I think we generally do recommend that if you have a large number of Android users, if you're providing the hardware, that you really should have a mobile device management solution. This allows you to push updates to these devices or to identify uh, where they are or who is the user that is logged in or when is the last time that they submitted data. So it gives you a lot more control over kind of your fleet of users and the devices that they have. Um, also gives you control over things like being able to lock down a device if it's been stolen um, or even do a remote wipe of the device. So generally, we would say that it's important to consider the mobile device management. There are a number of platforms that are available to use. Uh, many countries have done this already successfully using DHS2 and the Android solution. Um, so I put a link in the community of practice to uh, some of the documentation that we provide there. Um, maybe I'm just glancing now to see if there are any hands raised, anybody that wanted to ask a question. Maybe I'll give you a a moment to think if you want to speak up and ask. Uh, I don't see any hands right now, Mike, but uh, if anyone wants to click on reactions and then the raise hand icon, if you want to get the mic. I'm just also scrolling through the questions that have come in on the community of practice, see if there are any others that uh, we can spend some time on. Okay, 
So some of these are, are a, a bit specific. So maybe the, the best thing to do then if, I, if we don't uh, have uh, any questions to ask right now, uh, maybe we'll close this session out. We'll keep uh, referring back to the questions that have been asked in the community of practice. Um, again, you can continue to post some questions there after the webinar as well. Uh, feel free, we'll monitor that uh, thread in the community of practice and we'll, we'll answer more. Uh, this webinar recording will also be made available so that you can share with colleagues and so that others can view it. Um, we uh, also will be sharing the slides uh, that we've used. Uh, so those will be given to you with all of the links that we mentioned. And maybe at this point, I will now turn it over to Alice to close us out with a couple of thoughts about uh, the annual conference that's up upcoming and maybe the Tracker Implementation Academy. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, yes, so I have posted a um, few information in the chat about the annual conference. So it's basically the largest event of the year gathering. Um, last year we had more than 900 participants. So during five days from 21st June to 25th June this year, uh, the, the entire community will be gathered to share experiences around DHIS2 and learn more about the new features. So I posted the link in the, in the chat. So do not hesitate to click on the link to read more about the annual conference and why not register. Um, now, yes, we also have the Tracker Implementation Academy that will be hosted from 25th May to 4th June. Most of you have actually have already registered to the Academy, but for those who haven't, the link to the registration form is still live. So do not hesitate to go on the DHIS2 website, um, the Academy webpage, and you will be able to find the Tracker Implementation um, Academy link for registration. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing some of you in the Level 2 Academy.